Stephen Konopelski has taken a winding path to get into our industry, and he's got a bunch of scars and stories to prove it. Learn how he found pastry in his act two and how his act one as a ballet dancer and a Broadway performer has helped him form the work he now does. Stick around for a great conversation. There's an old saying that goes something like this. You'll only find three kinds of people in the world. Those who see, those who will never see, and those who can see when shown. This is Restaurant Strategy, a podcast with answers for anyone who's looking. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Chip Close and this is Restaurant Strategy podcast dedicated entirely to the hospitality industry. We cover marketing operations and everything in between. Each week, I leverage my 20 plus years in the industry to help you build a more profitable and a more sustainable business. I also work directly with operators all over the world through my group coaching programs to help you address and overcome the specific challenges we face in our industry. Curious to learn more? Set up a free 30-minute strategy session at restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. Let me show you how simple it can be to run a profitable restaurant. Again, restaurantstrategypodcast.com slash schedule. As always, you'll find that link in the show notes. Now, we all know managing costs is one of the most important parts of running a profitable restaurant, especially now. But between fluctuating vendor prices, waste, labor, and the never-ending list of tasks that demand your attention on a daily basis, it can be challenging for even the most experienced of us to manage costs well. That's where Margin Edge comes in. Margin Edge is a complete restaurant management software that automatically uses data from your POS and invoices to show you your food and labor costs in real time. Don't wait until it's too late. Margin Edge gives you tools to make decisions in the moment, like a daily P&L, price alerts on key ingredients, and real-time plate costs, all without ever having to touch a spreadsheet. Take control of your costs, work more efficiently, and be more profitable. Learn more at marginedge.com slash chip. Again, that link is in the show notes. Now, my guest on today's show is Stephen Konopelski. He is a pastry chef instructor at the Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you so very much for having me. I am so happy to be here today. I appreciate you uh, making the time. Uh, listen, there's a lot that we're going to get into. Uh, I want to talk about uh, you teaching and how you got there. But I want to go way, 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 way back because as uh, I was doing my research for this interview, I discovered that uh, culinary is actually your second act of sorts. Uh, so talk to me. Take me way back. How did you get introduced? How did you get down this line of uh, cooking and pastry? And what did you do to begin with? And, and talk to me about that transition. Okay, so you're asking the uh, the hundred thousand dollar question, as it were. We're, we're starting right at the top. Right <laughs> we'll start right at stuff. the top. I am a farm kid, so I grew up in Saskatchewan, Canada, literally in the middle of nowhere. We're talking. The closest town is 25 minutes away, population 92, um, <laughs> and that kind of was my life. So I grew up on a grain farm. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a household where most everything was made. You know, we had a huge garden. I can remember coming home, and it was like, hey, we're killing the pigs today because we're going to butcher them now. Um, you know, my mom made some of our clothes, baking, canning. I kind of grew up in that world. So the kitchen is someplace that was always very, very comfortable for me. So when it came time to retire from my first life, which we'll talk about in a second, the kitchen was just sort of that natural sort of place that I wanted to gravitate to. You know, when you're right. a career changer, you're thinking, okay, I'm deliberately setting my next track. Where do I feel comfortable? You're not kind of doing like a little crapshoot sort of thing as you might when you're, you know, like 18 and fresh out of high school and you're like, the world's my oyster. What am I going to do? I'll backpack <laughs> across Europe for, you know, six months and learn to play the cello. Like you don't do any of that when you're blah, 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 years old. You say, what do I like? What can I do? And so the <laughs> kitchen was just this place that was comforting to me. And I've always loved baking, especially. So that just sort of, 
was the trajectory towards I need to have a life in the culinary industry. Um, but rewind from that, I uh, am a classically trained ballet dancer. So I started dancing when I was eight years old, got introduced to it. Our babysitter, you know, kind of took um, classes at the local little studio, 45 minutes away in a different town. Um, <laughs> and I just sort of fell in love with it. Like it just was, you know, so magical and inviting. So, you know, I begged my mother, can we do this? Yes, of course. I started dance lessons. Once I got to 12, I started going to like summer programs and things. Then I got accepted yep. to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, um, to their summer school professional program. The summer school program was the audition for the year round program, which I got accepted to. So then I'm basically at like, you know, the Canadian equivalent of Juilliard for dance. Um, you know, like, okay, classical ballet is going to be my life. And, you know, we're talking eight, 10 hours a day, six days a week type of situation. Yeah. I'm like 17 years old, living away from home, um, discovering, you know, all of the things. And about the last year of ballet school, I got introduced to musical theater. Someone had said, Cats, the German company, is auditioning, and they really need, like, strong technical dancers. So I'm like, sure, you know, why not? So I went in and I auditioned. I didn't get it. But I just fell in love with that kind of world. And I was a little bit worried, staying in the ballet world, that I would be typecast. I'm 5'7" and a half um yeah. <laughs> and in the ballet world if you're not a tall guy you're not a prince you're not a lead you are like a character role yeah and i didn't want the irony is never lost on me i didn't want to be in an industry what? where i would be typecast all the time based on my height uh so i left the ballet world for musical theater where i was typecast <laughs> for my height um <laughs> So I left one typecasting and threw myself into a world of um, more typecasting. But uh, yeah, I kind of packed my bags. Uh, I moved to New York City September 26th, 2001. So just after, you know, a huge world changing experience and um, made New York my home for a very long time. And I worked professionally in the musical theater industry on Broadway and film and television up until um, 2011 when retirement hit to go to culinary school. So talk to me about, so uh, famously, you, you and I have uh, quite a, a bit in common, which is why I think I uh, responded so much the, the more uh, research I was doing and the, the further I was digging, because um, I was also introduced to, at, uh, to ballet at a young age and I fell in love with it. And I started training in Philadelphia and eventually that led me into musical theater and all of that. And I came to the city, um, you know, went and got my BFA in musical theater, came here to pursue a career in the arts and uh, restaurants. Uh, people say, oh, how'd you get introduced to restaurants? I was like, I did what every out-of-work actor does. You go get a job in restaurants because you got to take class in the day. You got to audition during the day. So you obviously have to pay your bills. You got to make money at night. It was just natural that I would go uh, start working in restaurants. And for a while, I had two parallel careers. I had a career in the arts and a career in um, in restaurants. And the further I went along, the more restaurants became bigger and bigger and bigger. And I always joke around. I said, at a certain point, I stopped and I looked back and I said, oh, my my, my theater resume is okay. Um, but my restaurant resume is, uh, is outstanding. Um, and maybe there is something here. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm fighting something I shouldn't be fighting. And it, can I find my, my place in here and all of that? Talk to me about your time, the 10 years that you spent performing. Were you performing back to back to back for 10 years? Or what did you do in between gigs? Did Were you introduced to restaurants at that point? Or was that really just later? I think I'm the only actor to grace the the city of New York in history that has never once waited tables as a working actor. Um, I was very fortunate to kind of have a lot of jobs that sort of went back to back to back. 
And um, the survival jobs that I did do were a little bit kind of more obscure. Like I actually worked at the Columbia University bookstore for a good uh-huh. amount of time. And then I did the stupid things that everybody does. I stood out on street corners handing out, I don't know, free stuff, um, you know, for marketing, direct marketing companies. And um, I did a lot of... Um, judging for dance competitions and stuff between sort of performing gigs. I was a certified personal trainer at one point. So kind of working in the gym world, that type of stuff. So that was kind of a little bit more like my survival gig. Um, and that uh, unemployment check, you know, I was in unemployment, (laughs) the musical for a little while as well, but I never did wait tables. And I think some of it was coming to New York city I didn't really have any like table waiting experience except for some, like I was a banquet waiter when I was in ballet school to help sort of, you know, uh, pay my bills. But banquet waiting is very, very different than restaurant waiting. Banquet waiting is here's your food. Goodbye. You know, like you never interact with anybody. And so I think I did interview for a lot of restaurants, but so many were like, there's all these other people that have all this experience and here you are like with nothing, like goodbye. Like we, we don't, we don't care. So I had to sort of force myself into different survival jobs. Cool. So I think that's really interesting. Now I'm going to ask a different question then. So you're performing for 10 years. What was the, can you remember back? Like what was the thing that you were like, okay, I'm done doing this and it's time for something else. Can you, cause I, I think, and this is where I think a lot of people listening, um, even if they didn't go through a performing career before they moved over into restaurants, um, a lot of people have restaurants as an act too, which we can which we can get to as to why. But talk to me about that that pivot, that that decision that you had to go through. I think some of it was what was happening in food entertainment at the time. So I started considering retirement around two thousand and seven. And that, I think, is when Food Network was really kind of at its sort of boom and height of being something sort of brand new. So some of what drew me to the restaurant restaurant world or the food industry in general, I think, is ego. And I can, I can admit that. You know, all of a sudden, we had celebrity chefs in the spotlight. You know, if you were fortunate enough to dine in specific circles, then you may ha- have known who some of these chefs were. But all of a sudden, we had chefs with now celebrity staff. And I think that that was sort of the height of that historically. So that's all kind of coming to the forefront. The actor in me is going, oh, hey, you know what? Maybe I could have my own TV show as like a uh, personality or a, um, you know, somebody who can entertain and um, educate all at the same time. This is something that didn't exist before. Maybe there's sort of something here. Now, what was also happening sort of, you know, I started dancing when I was eight years old. By the time it was like 2008, you know, I'm pushing 30. And so I'm just kind of like, I've been doing this for a long time. I was getting a little bit tired of being typecast. You're too old to be young, but you're too young to be old. You know, I met the, you know, the towering five, seven and a half that I am. Uh, So I felt like kind of some things were sort of slipping me by. And the whole thing of in the theater industry, you don't have a job because you're looking for the next job and you're looking for the two jobs down the road and sometimes three jobs down the road. And even if you're lucky enough to get a Broadway show, which I was three times, it was still like this show only exists until the people decide to stop coming and then it's over and you're done. Uh, You know, I did Beauty and the Beast. I got into the company of Beauty and the Beast and was like, oh, hey, this is great. This show's been around for 13 years. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, we're closing it. We're going to do Little Mermaid instead. Goodbye. And then so everybody (laughs) that had made, you know, there was one guy who was original cast. And all of a sudden he's like, crap, now I got to actually, after 13 years, I have to find a new job. And that part I didn't like. I wanted some security and stability in my personal relationship, I was getting to the point where it's like, okay, you know, I need to be a little bit more stable. I can't keep saying no to things because a job might come, you know, like I missed half of my sister's wedding because of work. And I didn't want to live for this career anymore. And then the final catalyst in all of that was my dad got diagnosed with cancer 
and I went back to the farm to help out and it just sort of everything kind of came flooding forward of like there is so much more to life than just living for your career and if you don't have something else in place what is the point of all of this and that kind of allowed me to be brave enough to go okay I've had a great career. I did some amazing things. I worked with some amazing people. I did what I set out to do when I got off that plane in 2001. Now I can give myself permission to have another dream and permission to follow that dream and close the book on this chapter and go, you know what? That was fun. That was great. And I will live that forever, but I don't need to keep living it right now. I think this is a really important story to tell because this, I mean, as you go through it, you make it sound so obvious, um, and and there's something sort of inevitable about it. But I'm sure it was anything but. I'm sure it was really hard, as you say. You're, you know, your your father gets sick, and you're faced with really um, hard decisions and 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 new realities and things like that. Um, and every time my career sort of transitioned, it was really hard. And it wasn't until like the fourth or fifth time I sort of, you know, went in a new direction that I didn't see coming that I was just like, oh, I got this. I'm just going to go with it. And I have sort of gave over to it much easier. I've given over to it much easier um, the last couple of times than I certainly did the first couple of times um, because it felt like failing at one thing. So I'm doing another rather than, you know, something's trying to push you down a different direction and, uh, like you said, there, there's more to life. So I, I love that, and I appreciate that, and I think a lot of the listeners um, will understand that. Certainly, uh, many started doing one thing and ended up doing another. They opened a restaurant thinking it was going to be one thing, and it ended up being another. Um, I, I think that's uh, that's sort of something we don't talk enough about, and it's something that's um, personally really, really interesting to me. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. So talk to me then. 2007, eight, you're starting to feel like, hey, maybe it's time to to hang it up. But it was a couple more years before you ended up doing it. What was the thing? How did you how did you make that jump? And and you said that it was always going to be culinary. There was something sort of obvious about that, since of because of how you grew up. But talk to me about that decision and and how did you end up uh, getting that culinary education? I uh, looked at a lot of, you know, culinary schools that were within the area, you know, in New York. And I, you know, looked at some, you know, smaller little things out in Long Island. And I had toured the French Culinary Institute. I toured the Institute of Culinary Education. I got, you know, all kinds of stuff from the CIA. Of course, the CIA was wanting things like SAT scores and all this. And I was like, I didn't do any of this, you know, like I was right out of high school and I'm like, okay, goodbye. You know, like that's pretty much what my yeah. my life was. So that the CIA definitely did not seem like a place that I could go and, you know, being, you know, sort of like I was a New Yorker and, and all of this. Um, <laughs> I just felt that the French Culinary Institute was really the place that I belonged after my research. But I also knew based on my performing career, there really is something to pedigree. If you've got a good name behind you, that opens up doors for you. Then it's your talent that keeps you inside the door. Um, You know, that's what opened up so many audition doors for me is they saw Royal Winnipeg Ballet School, you know, on my resume. They're like, oh, here's somebody who's like legit. This isn't somebody that, you know, trained with like Barbara dances in her backyard dot com or something, you know, like this is like legit stuff. And that's what, you know, every industry has that. If you've got a good pedigree, that's going to open up a lot of doors for you. And that's exactly how I felt about the French Culinary Institute. And then when I walked through the school for the first time and just saw everything, and then, of course, you know, like, oh, there's Jacques Pepin. Oh, and there's, you know, like Jacques Torres. And oh, Ron Ben Israel just walked by again. Oh, Bobby Flay is a graduate of this. You know, it just kind of snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And I'm like, this is yep. where I belong. So, yes, I will take out my student loan. And, you know, I will fully kind of go here. The year that I retired, I had four or five theater jobs, just back to back to back to back to back. And I had been an assistant for quite some time. I worked with a, with a choreographer who he had a great career. It was pretty much any show he did. It was like, hey, Steve, do you want to come do this show too? And I was like, okay, sure, why not? Um, and he was even um, sending out the the um the first national touring company of the anything goes revival and he's like do you want to go like 
we'll put you in it. And I was like, well, no, I've decided to retire. So there was even a point where I just was sort of like, well, maybe another year. Maybe yeah, like yeah. another year after that. Um, and I just kind of was like, no. I felt it was the time. The path was kind of leading in that direction, as you're saying. Um, I had mentally prepared myself that I was going to do something else. And I wanted, I think that's the other thing is I was starting to kind of, the engine was revving a little bit for, I want to try something else. I want to grant myself permission to pursue this new dream. And maybe even it was a little bit, Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, self-indulgent it may also have been a little bit like you know i love to sort of push myself and push my boundaries so i was in an industry that i was very comfortable in and this is something that's completely new and exciting and there's this little part of me that's like will i succeed or not well i know i will but i still need to see it through so yeah let's do this and i shut off social media uh i didn't want to see what shows my friends were getting i didn't want to have any regrets um, or regrets if you're lucky enough to have that tattoo. Um, <laughs> and I just, I just wanted to do it. So I was like, yeah, all right, let's go. Let's do it. Let's commit. Great. So was it always pastry? You said you always loved baking. Was it, was it always pastry from the start or did you learn it all? Oh my God. I can't believe I'm going to about uh, to share this because I know somebody out, some of the listeners are probably going to be like, because in this industry, Pastry people and culinary people, you know, we're like army and navy, right? We, at the end of the day, we fight for the same thing, but we will be mortal enemies in anything else until we have to come together, and then we're best friends. Um, and so, I think it was my first day. I, I wanted to be in pastry because I just sort of, again, there was that, like, maybe I'll have my own, like, baking show, and I can, you know, decorate and be, be a fool and whatever. Um... And I love sugar and I love all things sweet. On my very first day of culinary school, our chef instructor was like, any Neanderthal can grill meat, but a true artist bakes. And I was like, damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> so I just was sort of like, I think I belong here. They're as crazy as me. <laughs> I love that. It's, you know, it was this defined to me a long time ago that, uh, that, cooking right that like grilling is art and uh and baking pastry is science uh because you can't you can't fake it um you, you actually got to measure everything down to the gram yeah. uh, which is good uh, which is probably why um i'm not very good at baking because uh, i'm not a detail-oriented person um big picture outside the box creative all of that um and when i bake uh i have to really work at it because i just want to be like ah it's close enough um, rather than bringing out the, bringing out the scale. Okay. So, um, I can appreciate that. Did you go through, did you, uh, cause I'm not that familiar with it. Did you pick like, is there a pastry sort of focus? Did you, were you just sort of like pastry all, all along? The, the program is like all things pastry. Here's the full umbrella, you know, from cakes to breads to, we did confiserie chocolates. We made ice creams. We did kind of everything that's in the pastry umbrella and kind of there was like this sort of unspoken like moment at school when they're like you kind of want to decide are you going to be the restaurant type of person or are you going to kind of gravitate towards a bakery type of person or are you going to go into like chocolate because if that's its own world in and of itself um choose <laughs> you know kind of thing and i was like no i want to do all of it i love all of it equally i couldn't possibly make a decision um, so I kind of started to look for jobs that would allow me to use as much of that skill as possible. While I was in school, I uh, worked at Saxon and Parole, um, which is a great little restaurant um, it, down in, uh, I think it's in um, probably Soho. My, it, I don't know if the neighborhoods have changed now. It, it's <laughs> in some neighborhood there in New York with a bunch of letters. Um and then I worked, uh, I was like, okay, I've done restaurant few things now. And then I wanted to do sort of big batch and banquet and things. So then I went and worked out at the Garden City Hotel on, out on Long Island um, and did, you know, huge stuff. And then I was like, okay, this was sort of fun. And then I kind of need something else that's going to, you know, kind of move my career along. And uh, I ended up working for uh, Claudia Fleming as her assistant at the... Um, North Fork Table and Inn out in South Pole. Just let me drop all these names, everybody. Get a 
a broom and sweep them up. Um, <laughs> and t- while I worked for her, I just gained this sort of newfound respect for ingredients at their core and giving them the respect that they deserve. A very, very French model of, you yep. know, cooking. No, uh, not a lot of fuss and still presenting everything in like a very kind of elegant way. And I just, I just, uh, I was like a sponge. I, I don't, as most good mentors are, I don't think she really knows the impact that she's had on my career because I just watched in total awe yeah. at everything that she did. And then it kind of became that ego again, maybe a little bit that's like, you know, okay, this has been fun, but the job that I want maybe it doesn't really exist. So I'll just create it. And that's where it kind of became the situation of let's open up a business. Um, you know, my husband and I decided to move down to Maryland because his entire family lives here in Maryland. So we wanted to be closer to them. We were getting sick and tired of driving, you know, all the way for Christmas and Thanksgiving. And the nieces and nephews were getting to the point where there was clarinet recitals and little league games and things that we needed to go to. So it just seemed like we wanted to be closer to family. So, we bought a 5,000 square foot Victorian house and opened up a bed and breakfast. It was like so cliche. Now, today's episode of Restaurant Strategy is also brought to you by Seven Shifts. Seven Shifts is a team management platform built specifically for restaurants. Great restaurants built by great teams and Seven Shifts is your secret weapon to better understand your restaurant, hit labor targets, and keep your entire team connected. With drag and drop scheduling, in-app communication, task management, tip management, and more, it makes restaurant work a lot easier. From back of house to front of house, managers, franchise owners, and larger corporate teams, Seven Shifts has benefits at every single level. Plus, it integrates with the other systems your restaurant already uses, like POS and payroll. Turn your team into your competitive advantage. Restaurant Strategy Podcast listeners get three months absolutely free. Get started at sevenshifts.com slash restaurant strategy. That's the number seven, S-H-I-F-T-S dot com slash restaurant strategy to get three months free and join over 30,000 restaurants using Seven Shifts today. Again, that link is in the show notes. I love it. So you work in a restaurant. So you're working with, uh, you know, Brad Farmery and that whole crew at Saxon. Uh, you go, you do the big banquet thing. You go work with uh, uh, Claudia Fleming is uh, certainly uh, pastry royalty, uh, certainly in uh, this city where I am in New York. Um, and then you were just like, let's go do this crazy thing, buy this bed and breakfast. Pretty <laughs> and much, you like, That's you know? the next yeah. thing. That was the next thing. Some of it was um, I had, you know, like uh, been interviewing for different places, like in Washington, D.C. and kind of in the area um, sure. being like, well, maybe I can find, you know, it's Washington, D.C. Of course, I'm going to be able to find a job. Um, and I had gotten offered a couple of things. Um, it just didn't really click. It didn't feel right. And I had really learned to sort of trust my instincts in a lot of things just throughout the course of my life and kind of being at these couple of places. And I was like, it's a job, but I don't think that this is going to be a home for me. I don't think this is going to be a career. I think this is just a job and I need more than that because I put aside a career for this second thing. So I wanted to make sure that all of my decisions were kind of really purposeful. And there was that thing about, what can we create out of nothing? And so I want to I want to talk about this real quick because I, I think you bring up an important thing, and we were talking about this a little bit before we hit record. This idea, this difference between a career and a job, and I've certainly talked about this on the show before, and I'll certainly remind people of uh, of something that's very present in my mind, which is this idea that uh, there are two different kinds of people who work for us in restaurants. Number one, the people who are really driven, passionate, ambitious, people who really want to be part of hospitality, love service, love culinary, all of that. Uh, But then uh, it's a real reality that we have to face is that at least the other half, um, this is just a means to an end. It's a day job. I mean, I certainly shared my story that for a long time, it was just, it was just that it was a, it was a survival. Um, It was a survival job. There are people, there are, you know, actors and dancers and musicians and comedians and then students and teachers working restaurants as a second job or as a summer job that there's just 
a ton of people who work for us and work with us who this is just a means to an end. So here, when you start talking about, you know, this was a job, um, not necessarily a career, and they were stepping stones and you were learning things, talk to me about this this idea of intention, because this is a word that's come up a lot over the course of this past year um, with me, with my clients, um, certainly in the way that I've shaped my own personal career in my business, um, trying to be more intentional about what I do. Talk to me about Talk to me about that and, and how that factored into the decisions you made. I have always been a creative person. You know, like that's kind of just the curse <laughs> that I've been blessed with throughout my life. It is one of the reasons that I gravitated towards pastry. It's because not only am I a creative person, but I also am very detail oriented. That's how dance was for me. It's very technical, mm -hmm. but with when you know the technique, you can kind of create anything. And that's exactly how I saw pastry is I saw it as being incredibly technical and yet incredibly creative at the same time. And I think where I had been in the jobs that I had had up until this point, I didn't, I wasn't granted very much opportunity to be creative. I was kind of, you know, the workhorse as it were. And there's a time and a place for that. And I enjoyed it very much. But the creative side of me was starting to kind of, you know, kick forward a little bit and was like, I need some place to be able to kind of stretch, especially because I had learned this whole new set of skills and was honing them and wanting to kind of be at that place where what can I do creatively with these skills now as well? And that's where this idea of sort of, you know, opening my own business really was um, you know, it was appealing. I dragged my feet for a while on this. You know, my husband was like six months before he said, like, we can do this. Let's go. And I was like, I, don't. I was like, I know how much work this is going to be <laughs> to build something from nothing. Um, yeah. and was kind of just like literally praying to Julia Child and all of the other kitchen gods that I was like, let something else kind of happen. Um, but none of the things that were presented to me, just they didn't feel fulfilling enough. And so I thought, you know what? Screw it. Let's try it. You know, let's see what happens. You know, see what you can do. And you're, you're never going to know what you can accomplish until you actually try. Right. You know, wasn't it Yoda that was like, try and surprise yourself by what you accomplish. You might, you know, <laughs> so I just. I, I, I needed to I, I needed to give myself that permission and and I, I talked to a lot of my still performing friends that haven't been performing for quite some time and they're still kind of hanging yeah. on to that dream but they're incredibly talented in other areas and they have started to make good careers for themselves in these other areas but they still classify themselves as a performer first not a whatever yeah. else they're doing they haven't yeah. granted themselves permission to have a new dream because it feels like you're admitting failure, but that's not the case. You know, granting yourself permission to have a new dream is us opening, a, starting from scratch all over again kind of thing. And I just needed to be there. I needed to, to, to be in that world and I needed to create something and just watch it grow or implode. Yeah, so one of the things I think we don't do enough of, and this is, I don't know, culturally, maybe this is uh, an American thing. No, I'm speaking to a Canadian, so maybe it's, uh, <laughs> maybe it's in, the, in, your, uh, in your culture as well. But we don't, what I've tried to get really good at doing is something that I wasn't good at doing when I was younger, which is that this idea of taking stock and really making sure that we reorder our priorities or we're honest with where our priorities are. Um, you know, I always tell people, I said, you know, I started my business seven years ago. My son's seven years old. Like, that's not an accident. There was a, there was a reordering in my life. Um, my priorities had shifted literally, literally overnight. And so I, it was just, it, things became immediately clear that weren't clear. Um, and it, for me, it took, it took that or, you know, maybe I was down the road a little bit before that. But if things were harder to, if it was harder to do that when I was younger, it became much, much easier um, after my son was born. And and I think that's, I think that's something we don't do enough and we don't talk about enough, which is that we just take take stock, take a step back, close your eyes, take a deep breath, shut everyone else out, and say, where am I? 
What am I doing? Am I doing what I want to be doing, what I'm meant to be doing? Is there anything else that I want to accomplish? Where am I? Because where you are, the person I was at 15 is different than at 20 and 25 and 30, 35, now at 42, for sure. I'm, I'm a different person. The things that I believe are different, uh, which is good, right? <laughs> we grow up, we learn yeah. more, we uh, we make uh, better better decisions. Um and and I think and I think that's okay. And there's there's just something weird about this. And I think it's because so many careers in this country, certainly performing, is one of them, where you have to start so young and you have to go all in at such an early age. Certainly, um, sports are like this in this country. There there are lots of other things where you just have to make a commitment at such an early age. Um, and it doesn't give you a lot of. I mean, like the grooves get so deep, it's tough to sort of pull the train out of the out of the grooves and go and go in a different direction and and i wish for all of our sakes um we got better at just and i I try to do this still every year the few days right before new year's it's you know obviously the end of the year beginning of a new year it's an easy time to do that we're already thinking about you know blank canvas turning the page all of that but i still do that i still take stock and just say great what did i do last year what did i what do i want more of you know what of that do i want more of in the year ahead and what do I not, what's not serving me anymore? What do I want less of really? And what can I do in the coming year to put myself on a path that's going to ultimately serve me and, um, and benefit me and my family and, and serve the priorities that I have. Um, and I make it very formal, um, cause that's fun to me. Uh, and, but it doesn't have to be. And I wish, I wish more of us did it because to your point, right, you still talk about a bunch of people who are no longer performing and they've got so many talents and gifts to give outside of that field, um, that you only wish they'd embrace, acknowledge and and sort of give to the world. Everybody has so many things that they can offer. And if you don't, I think part of Uh, your message as far as stopping and taking stock is also a bit of a reminder of, well, what are all the other things that I'm also good at? Because we start to kind of feel like our identity can only be this sort of like one thing. And that when I retired from performing was that was the one thing that was a little bit hard is because I was Steve the dancer. I didn't really know who else I was. And, um, but I knew that I had a lot more to offer the world. I just kind of, hadn't uncovered those types of things and in stopping and taking stock of that and kind of reprioritizing whatever it also is a bit of a reminder of oh yeah i'm also kind of good at this thing or oh yeah i have this talent too and i think perhaps in the restaurant industry maybe we don't do that enough not only with ourselves as like chefs but as the menu or you know the business model in general what what is Oh, remember we did that one thing that one time it was really, really great. Maybe we should be revisiting that again. Or we tried it and it wasn't very successful, but that was four years ago and times have changed. The climate has changed. The customer has changed. Maybe we could revisit this and make something of it. If there's anything that's become apparent over the last three years since the pandemic, it's that the customer has changed. Who they are and what they need from us has changed. And um, and I find we're not asking enough. You know, Danny Meyer famously said, right, the industry was built on the promise of cheap rent and cheap labor. So what do we do when none of those things, when neither of those things are, uh, are true anymore? And now add to that um, uh, rising food costs, right? Yeah. Like. It's really expensive to go out to eat. I mean, I don't know, anybody listening here, it's really expensive to go shop for groceries. Um, it, it just it just is. And so the model is going to have to change. Um, the thing the thing that really breaks my heart uh, at the moment is um, is it doesn't feel like we learned from the pandemic. And we're sort of right back to where we were. I'm watching it. I'm watching single single digit profit margins. I'm watching uh, people being unafraid to raise the prices, even though they know they're running at 38, 40, 42 percent food cost. They say, "Well, I can't raise it because then people won't come here." We have to we have to change our 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 value proposition. We have to convince people another in another way to come join us that. That food costs what it costs. It costs you a certain amount to bring it in, and then it costs you a certain amount to do something to that. We're just a factory. We bring in raw materials, we do something to that, and then sell a finished product. That's what a restaurant is. That's what we're doing, right? We're taking you know flour, we're turning it into bread. You know, we're taking raw fish, we're turning it into cooked fish. 
Um, and if that raw product is getting more expensive, we, we have to pass it along. Otherwise, the, the numbers don't work in the industry. They just, they just don't. Labor's too expensive. Rent's too expensive. And now food's too expensive. So to your point, like, again, it's, that, it's the priorities. It's, it's challenging, uh, challenging ourselves to, to rethink and not, and not be afraid to say, okay, what does it need to be? What do my people need now? Are they willing to spend this amount of money for this product or do I have to do something else? Are they willing to spend less for a different product or more for another product? Um, I think that's, we, we don't do, we don't do that enough. I love this line of conversation. So tell me about the, tell me about the bed and breakfast. So, um, we move into this tiny little town, right? There's about maybe 5,000 people on, uh, Eastern shore of Maryland, um, we were a little bit deliberate in our choosing of things. One, of course, is, you know, the cost of the house itself. Um, we uh, set up business in a county that didn't have a bed and breakfast at all. So there's no competition. So mm -hmm. that was, you know, <laughs> there's a great, uh, you know, business model. <laughs> you have no competition, so you can kind of do what you want. Um, and uh, we had a vision of what it could be but we knew at the very beginning it, it couldn't be that we had a vision that one day we would be able to do catering and we had a beautiful property you know kind of looked out on the water it was almost an acre um and so the way we sort of set it up was in the future we could have you know events on this lawn in the future we could do this you know we installed like a really cool patio under like two huge sweeping magnolia trees it was so cinematic um we you know made sure that everything was little vignettes so we both rob and i hate forced interaction and we didn't want our bnb to be one where it's like everyone sits down at the family style table and has awkward conversation with people they've never met and will never speak to ever again we're like no we're not doing that so we did little cafe tables everywhere. Everything was always like groups of two. You could sit out on the property anywhere and have an intimate moment, but other people could still be around and not, you know, be affected by what you were doing or vice versa. So we kind of had a larger goal, but we knew we couldn't get there right from the very beginning. It's a terrible business model, you know, like throw everything out. Uh, so we just kind of started with just the bed and breakfast and, uh, the local clientele was like, well, how do we, how do we have breakfast with you? I'm like, well, you have to stay the night. Well, we don't want to stay the night, but we still want to get, get breakfast because you're the pastry chef. How does this work? So <laughs> we were sort of like, well, maybe let's start like a Sunday brunch that the locals can come to. And, um, that became like super popular. And our model was very different. We didn't sort of set it up restaurant style. It was almost like a special catered event type of situation where people bought tickets in advance. So then we knew exactly how many people were coming. We knew exactly how much money yeah. to spend on food, all this type of stuff. And we deliberately kept it exclusive. So we didn't do it every Sunday. We only did it once a month. And um, eventually we only uh, graduated towards twice a month, but we never did it any more than that. And we had people buying tickets for brunch sometimes eight months in advance because of how exclusive it was. Right. Um, and then we started participating in the local farmer's market. And that went really, really well. And we would sell out very, very quickly. And then it was like, well, why go to the farmer's market, which is three blocks away, when we've got this sweeping Davenport, let's just do pastries on the porch in the, on Saturday mornings. So we started doing yep. that and people would line up around the block to come and get the pastries because we would still, you know, sort of sell out. And then that sort of graduated towards, well, we have this parlor front room in our house that nobody really uses. Let's set this up as like a little pastry shop. So then it was open like four days a week and people could just come in and get some fresh pastries. And then that needed to be five days a week. And then things just kind of started to snowball. And all during this, we're picking up like more catering stuff. We're doing br uh, bridal showers, baby showers, small weddings, um, I started doing like a lot more uh, wedding cakes got, you know, showcased in Martha Stewart and The Knot and Brides Magazine. And then Food Network fell into my lap and I did like four different episodes uh, or appearances on Food Network. Um, so everything just kind of kept snowballing and snowballing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And then we were presented with an opportunity to open like a standalone bakery in a neighboring town that was very affluent um, and being attached to a, an interior design shop where people were dropping like $500 on throw pillows and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So then when that opportunity presented itself, we're like, yeah, let's do that. We tried to keep everything going, but the standalone bakery was so successful that we were able to close everything else because we were making enough money just with the bakery that we didn't need yeah. to do the other. And I was of course, you know, like exhausted. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we just, we, we had made this decision from the day one. If it worked, pursue it. If it didn't, stop and try something else. So as things were kind of going, well, let's try this now. We, we would try it once. You know, we tried doing like a little beer garden kind of thing. Failed miserably. Never did it again. <laughs> Never did it again. You know, we did yeah. high teas. That was really popular for about six months. And then the only time people wanted to come to high tea was on Mother's Day and Christmas. So that's when we did it. Yeah. This. Uh, so then how long was that whole – I mean, I love the the evolution as you, as you lay it out. It's a perfect uh, segue from what we were just talking about to now where you're at. So how long was that whole evolution from – the bed and breakfast to all of these things and you're rolling and then you get the the space in town talk to me about that uh so we opened our doors may 2015 and the standalone bakery opened um september 2019 everything else closed down january 2020 except the bakery and then the COVID blessed us with all of this. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we hung on for as long as we could. And quite honestly, probably could still be open with the bakery. But what we were faced with was the lack of employees. We lost yep. over half of our workforce during the course of COVID. And, you know, this was 2020. We didn't have even vaccines yet. So nobody knew, like, what this was going to be. Was the world going to blow up? Were monkeys going to start talking? You know, like, all of these. <laughs> nobody knew. So, I remember. <laughs> um, you know, rightfully so. It just was kind of very, very challenging. And then I was presented with the opportunity uh, to become faculty with the uh, Scofia School of Culinary Arts. And I was like, wow, a full-time job with paid vacations and my weekends off and medical <laughs> and all of this <laughs> stuff. And I don't need to be on my feet 16 to 18 hours a day. Yep. Let's kind of do this. So um, we broke our lease. You know, we sold all of the equipment. And uh, that was a very painful day is locking you know, something that we had started from nothing um, to, to pursue something else. We were just so fortunate with the bakery and our partnership with um, our friend uh, uh, James Merida, who it has uh, Bountiful Interiors out in Easton, and um, he kind of created this space for us. And he's like, why don't you come do this? He kind of wanted that Macy's experience, right? Where you've got the cafe downstairs. You do a little shopping. You go downstairs. You get a little sandwich. You get a little cup of coffee. You get whatever. You gain your strength. <laughs> um, they did a lot of, like, consultations and stuff where people would be sitting three and four hours picking up tile and carpet samples. Like, you need a snack. Yeah. So it yep. was sort of like this partnership. And because of the exclusivity of his business, it allowed our bakery to kind of also adopt some of that. You know, our colors were like golds and browns and everything was gilded. We didn't have prices on pastries. There was no menu. Yeah. Like it was just kind of one of those, like you walk in and you say, I'm going to have this. And of course we told anybody and it wasn't like we were charging, you know, we we're a dollar for a chocolate chip cookie. We weren't, we weren't an arm and a leg or yeah. anything. But we had we were able to create this illusion of, you know, higher end exclusivity and we're able to kind of play into that based on the type of clientele that was at his store and based on what we had sort of built with, you know, some of the stuff that we did. 
And then it yep. kind of also became a little bit of this this status symbol. Oh, you're going to town to get things from the bakery with the brown box and the gold thing on it and stuff. And, you know, yep. it, it we created an experience as well as having, you know, like delicious pastries. But we created this experience. And I think that's what a lot of people also sort of really appreciated. I think I think it's what we all appreciate. It's, you know, it's... It's the little blue box, right? We know what a little blue box is. We know what you know. We know what the orange bag means. Like, and oh, you don't care if there's got... the ugliest thing in that little blue box. It can yep. be like a tie tack, you know, or like I have, I think, a magnifying glass in a little blue box that somebody gifted me, and I still have the blue box. <laughs> it's it's true. It's I do the same thing. We uh, it, yes yes absolutely. Here's the you know the interesting thing about all this is that what we do in restaurants, certainly what you're talking about here, is a luxury. I talk a lot about uh, the luxury mindset, right? This uh, Adopting this luxury mindset that, that luxury goods have this extraordinary markup, famously, the Hermes Birkin bag, right? Yes. They start at $35,000. That $35,000 bag costs roughly $880 to make. Why can they get away with this huge markup, right? We can, we can debate that forever, but there's something about that that I think we need to take a page from, that we're not selling food. We're selling an experience, some sort of experience, right? We can go get cheaper food. We can go get flour and eggs and butter and make a cookie for a fraction of the cost, certainly way under a dollar a cookie or $5 a cookie when I look at, you know, the Taylor chips or the Levain cookies and all that, right? People spend five, six bucks for a cookie. You can make a cookie for way less than that. That's just as delicious if you get good at it. So what are we paying for? What is the, the consumer paying for? And I think in our industry, we haven't gotten good enough across the board at describing that. I think, I think some people are really good at it. Um, and I think a lot more, um, a lot more of us can can stand to get better at understanding what we're actually selling. We're selling the brown box with the gold ribbon, the blue box, the orange Hermes, the you know, rather than the you know sweet little confection that's inside. We're selling something else. We're selling status. We're selling connection. We're selling whatever it is 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 different. Um, and and I, I think we would succeed more and be able to charge more um, and actually make people happier if we if we got better at doing that. I also think it doesn't have to be all of the luxury and you still have an amazing experience. And, you know, like whatever your lane is, commit to that lane. Like some of the most successful food trucks it's not just the food, it's the experience that you're having there, you know, or whatever. 100%. I think I think to some of like my favorite local like Mexican restaurants that are very inexpensive, but the service is is really cool. There's an ambiance, there's an atmosphere, there's you know, I'm 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 dining out not just to eat, I'm dining out to mm -hmm. have, you know, some sort of experience of some kind. I love super, super cheap stuff as well you know like i am living for a two dollar slice of pizza if there's the two dollar experience that goes with it you know yep. um and i don't think enough people in the restaurant industry consider that this whole thing is a show and maybe that's in yep. hindsight is one of the reasons that i was really attracted to this world is you if you know for those of you that are currently listening if you haven't figured it out by now you can take the boy out of broadway but you can't take the broadway out of the boy and <laughs> i think the more and more that i have realized that this industry in and of itself is a show you know it is you go to fine dining and you do not have like those all those waiters dropping everything at the exact same time in some sort of like choreographed sink. You're disappointed. You, uh, you know, if you are watching an open air kitchen and it is an absolute 
disaster in the back. You're disappointed because you expect to see that choreographed, well-oiled machine. Or you go to the place that's supposed to be the disaster because you're expecting the disaster and that's what you want. And then you go there, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, wait, you cleaned the floors? This place has a C and that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a show. There is some experience we're presenting. I always say we're not selling. Uh, we sell a product, but we're also selling a service. So are we service industry? Or are we a, a product based in- industry? We're not. I think we're an experience based industry. Yeah. Um, I, I wholeheartedly believe it. And it doesn't matter what sort of experience. My whole thing is that if we don't get intentional about that. Uh, about about creating experience and what kind of experience it is, we sort of fall back to the lowest common denominator. And so I spend a lot of time talking about this luxury mindset um, because I wish we'd adopt some of the the theory, the philosophy behind it. I don't want us to charge thirty five thousand dollars for dinner. Um, I just want us to be able to charge more than it costs us to make. Because on the other side is the commodity mindset, and the commodity mindset says that uh, all things being equal, right? I know nothing about pastry. I'm going to bake cookies with my son. I'm going to read the recipe off the back of the of the chocolate chips. And it says I need AP flour. I'm out of AP flour. Uh, I'm out of AP flour. I'm going to go to the supermarket. Commodity mindset says all things being equal, AP flour is AP flour, right? Of course, you're going to argue with me and you should because you know better. <laughs> but AP flour is AP flour to the majority of, let's say, Americans. All things being equal, they're going to make a decision based on familiarity, convenience, or price, right? It's either the one they remember having before, the one that they had at home that they're replacing, the one that's easiest to get to, meaning the one that's at their uh, at their supermarket, or the one that's you know easiest to reach on the shelf, yep. or price. The four of them lined up, they're both they're all easy to get to. Which one's the cheapest? Because you know what, all things being equal, this is just AP flour, and I don't know anything else. And I think it's our job to explain to the consumer why they should go out of their way to get our product, why they should be willing to spend a little bit extra. Hey, it's worth the extra 89 cents for the sack of flour for the following reasons. And to my mind, uh, I think flour companies uh, don't do a good job doing that. Egg companies and milk and on and on and on, right? We go and get, we don't look for a brand of milk. We get skim, 2%, whole. (laughs) We make our decision based on the kind of milk. Um, Very few people will go to the supermarket and decide, make any other decision. They're just going to get the one. They want the size and the kind. So skim, 2%, whole, a quart, a gallon. You know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. they're making those decisions. And the same thing is true in the restaurant industry. And it can be, it can be still cheap, but we still have to make a decision and we still have to communicate something to people as to why they should pick us as opposed to another person, why they should go out of their way to get ours instead of stay close to home to get the convenient one, why they should be willing to cross the street or pay a little bit extra for ours. And if a box with a gold bow helps them, uh, helps convince them of that, then it worked, even if it's the same price for a cookie as uh, as three other bakeries uh, around town. It, it just it helps provide them the answer to that. I am convinced that's what we need to do to save our industry. I think um, customers want to be educated. They want to know what their hard earned money is going into. And exactly to that point, if they are. If that difference is pointed out to them, then they're very willing to spend that extra little bit because they know now the quality that they're getting or the fact that it's like, oh, do you actually know how many steps go into creating this thing? Oh my God, I had no idea. Now I'm very excited about spending the $10 on this or, you know, whatnot kind of thing. The... The customer really does want to be educated. And they want a story. They want a story. And even if it's not obvious, right? Like this costs more because the products we use cost more. That's an easy one. But again, with the Hermes bag, why do I why should I spend four hundred percent, you know, <laughs> it cost them nine hundred dollars. I'm gonna spend thirty five thousand. The leather's great. The craftsmen are great. I mean, I could tell you the story, but it still cost them nine hundred dollars to make. So why the what the reason is the exclusivity? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. The history behind that bag, the the original shop, the fact that a craftsman will train 10 years and each bag is done from beginning to end by one person. It doesn't go down an assembly line. It's not like one person does the leather. Another person does the stitching. Another person does the clasps. It, it's one craftsman. So that gets to the heart of uh, the story that they can tell as to why it, it's still there's a. 99% of the people on this planet couldn't afford a $35,000 handbag, nor do they see the value of buying one. Right. But for the people who can and will and do, um, that that says something about what they're about what they're doing. The same is true for every product. Yeah. Talk to me about how so you shut the shop, it was not an easy decision. Um but again, it, we talk about the pivot, the the evolution of your career. So you land at Escoffier. So talk to me about Steve, the teacher. <laughs> um, I promised myself when I started teaching that I would be the mentor that the students deserved. I have been so fortunate to have people, I, five or six true, true mentors that just changed my life. And again, I don't think any of them know how much of an impact they've had on me, which is what makes them even that much better mentors. And so going into the, the education world, that's what I promised myself. And the most difficult thing about that is each one of the students needs and deserves something different. And so as I get to know my students, I kind of have to meet them where they are. And some of them are leaps and bounds uh, ahead of maybe where they should be. They they are coming, you know, as a career changer, or they've been doing recreational baking for you know thirty some odd years, and they would like to have that diploma so that they can hang it on their walk, shop in their business, and they can have more value to what it is that they're creating. Some of them are with us because. They might not have any other option. They're in a very small little rural community in the middle of nowhere. Community college isn't an option, um, but we have an online program. So we can access literally any student. And that's where I teach is in an online world. So I do kind of run this sort of gamut. And it's a very exciting part about my job. It's also very emotionally draining as I get to know my students, meeting them where they are and, and, and helping them out to the best that I can. Um, I consider myself primarily a, a cheerleader. I am trying to inspire a new generation of not necessarily just chefs, but young budding entrepreneurs. I'm trying to maybe inspire and um, help someone to see that, yeah, you've been doing it this way for 45 years, but there might be another way of accomplishing this. You know, there's more than one way to put on a pair of pants. And perhaps you've been doing two legs at a time, but one leg at a time works good too. <laughs> or, you know, vice versa. Uh, you know, in the 90s, we even put them on backwards for a while, and there was nothing wrong with that. Um, so, well, what's really interesting, and I want to interject really quickly, is that before we hit record, we were talking about how uh, years ago, even just 40, 50 years ago, nobody went to school to learn the culinary arts. You staged at a kitchen, and if you proved yourself uh, capable, you got a job, and you worked your way up through the kitchen, and eventually you worked enough stations to get promoted to sous chef, and then chef de cuisine, and then on and on, and then you moved over to another restaurant, on and on. Um, and then somewhere along the way, we got all these schools, um, so we formalized um, the education, and I think it's really interesting, obviously, with uh, how technology has taken over our world, um, it seems inevitable that we would have moved to online, and I am a huge huge proponent of sort of non uh, online learning non-traditional sort of uh, new way of um new way of doing it um that's how i got my uh mba uh, i was part of the executive program uh, and i learned online and did so much of my work on my own and then connected with my fellow cohort but it's a very different thing for culinary arts and certainly for pastry. So talk to me, there are campuses, but you specifically teach the online part of the program. So talk to me about the best and worst parts about that and how you've turned the worst parts into uh, into a, an asset as opposed to sort of grumbling about what you don't have. Oh, um, great, great question. I think 
one of the assets that we have in an online format is that we have to be innovators. We have to, we're flipping the script. And, you know, I think 30 years ago, your traditional restaurant, I grew up in the restaurant world, I started peeling potatoes and now I run the place kind of thing, poo-pooed any sort of form of uh, formal education whatsoever. Yep. Uh, as the world changes, we need to sort of change with it. And that's kind of where our society is in general, is there are so many things that we're able to do in a sort of online virtual type of format that we didn't think we could accomplish before. And I think culinary world is there. Things like taste and stuff is subjective at the end of the day. You and I can eat the exact same piece of whatever, but we're having two different experiences just because of biology. Your tongue's experiencing something different than mine is. And that can, of course, be the success of a dish, but sometimes it's not. Um, there's a textural component and stuff as well. What we can see texture, we don't necessarily have to experience or even feel texture. We can see texture and understand that this is sort of how it should be or how it sort of should not be. So uh, at Escoffier, we've had to kind of really sort of think about things in order to be able to be accessible to so many more students. If we were just with our ground campuses in, in, in Boulder and Austin, that's a very, very small select group of people. The kitchens are small. We can only accommodate so many students. But in an online format, we essentially, you know, can accommodate anybody that has, you know, access to the Internet. So we have created um, technical videos that basically teach our students the, the techniques that are filmed in professional kitchens. Um, and the students have access to all of that and they watch those videos. Each chef instructor has the responsibility of creating some additional content to sort of aid and assist the student in learning that. And then they create these things in their own home. Now, of course, that also can present itself with a whole new set of problems, availability to equipment, which of course is based on cost. The students are also providing all of their own ingredients, whereas at a ground school, you know, you walk in, the flowers there. Oh, we've got Calibo chocolate. Amazing. You know, I had access to so many things at culinary school that I was just like, I didn't know this existed. You know, passion <laughs> yeah, fruit yeah. puree. What is, you know, uh, all of these things doing like molecular gastronomy and all this type of stuff. For the person who's living in Topeka, Kansas, that's going to the local A&P, you know, to buy whatever ingredients they can get their hands on based on whatever budget they might have presents itself with a unique set of challenges. And sometimes me as the chef, I'm kind of having to go, OK, we can't find this, so we're going to use this instead, and that will still kind of make things work. Yeah. Or we're going to have to adjust the recipe accordingly. I've gotten really good at how to adjust a recipe to a gluten-free diet, um, you know, just based on, okay, you know, drop of a hat. Oh, chef, I'm, I, I am plant-based. So what can I use instead of eggs to make <laughs> these muffins? Okay, well, I know the answer to that now too. So my vocabulary has really sort of grown as far as like ingredients and stuff like that. To your point about the flour at the grocery store, I do, I'm kind of getting pretty good at recognizing, oh, that was not actually AP flour. You used self-rising flour just based yeah. <laughs> on what I'm seeing for your final result. So it's really helped me grow as a chef in a, a total visual medium, I have to use a specific vocabulary to help paint a visual picture on a medium that is really 100% tactile. And yeah. it's becoming really very successful. You know, at the end of the day, even the students that come through us or pretty much any ground culinary school, no one is starting at the top everyone is still starting kind of at the ground level, whether you've got an education or not. The thing that I think education does is it, it arms you with a set of skills, it arms you with a vocabulary, it arms you with a lot of confidence. So when you're walking in still as a kitchen grunt, you're going to jump that ladder a lot faster because yeah. of you're not having to learn the vocabulary, you're not having to learn some of these skills. You might just sort of be honing them. And that's what our students are doing. They're gaining the confidence. They're gaining the vocabulary. They're gaining um, exposure 
to something that they might not have had at all. I know we're really, really running short on time, but I want to share this story with you, and I am going to get emotional. I had a student quite a few terms back that basically like called and messaged me constantly. Is this right, Chef? Am I doing this right, Chef? Am I doing this right? And she was. She was doing everything correctly. But she didn't have enough confidence in herself to trust that little voice inside of her that was always saying, it's, it, it's correct. She was listening to that other voice, the one that we all have that says you're doing terrible. And through some conversations, we were able to kind of silence that negative voice and allow her to listen to that positive voice. And she did very, very well in, in, in my class and in the rest of school. You know, she is probably never going to grace the, the cover of, you know, Pastry Arts Magazine or anything like that. But she had enough confidence to put herself out there and try and better herself than what she was when she came to us. And she messaged me maybe about a month after graduation. Chef, I got my dream job and I'm so happy. And I was like, oh, this is exciting. What is it? And she's the donut decorator at her local Krispy Kreme. And for a lot of people, that might seem like a nothing job. But the fact that for this young lady, that was an achievement and a dream. And where did she come from that having the donut decorator job at the Krispy Kreme is so much better than anything that she had experienced? And because of, she hadn't, you know, because of our interactions, she may never have had that job. And now she is so happy doing something that she loves, making something that is delicious, and providing joy to other people. And that, at the end of the day, is what my job is right now. And I love that. And I love that for her. And I love whatever that story is going to be for the next student that I encounter and the student after that. Yep. I think what's really interesting is that um, something that I really appreciated about my education, again, going through the executive program to get my MBA, was this... Uh, the balance between synchronous and asynchronous learning, um, that there was a portion where I was in a class, in a lecture you know, uh, situation uh, with other fellow cohorts and all of that, but then there was a fair amount of work that was all on my own. It was a series of video lectures. It was a series of uh, you know, problems, things that I, case studies that I had to work through on my own. Um, that's different. That, that I, I love that now we're starting to think more deeply about the way that people learn and the way that people internalize things. And the other piece to this I wanted to say is that the world is so different than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30, 50 years ago. The way that business operates, the way that people can create businesses. 10 years ago, nobody knew what a TikTok was. Yeah. Let alone how you make six figures a year or a month on TikTok. And now there are people out there who make six figures a month on TikTok, on YouTube, on Instagram, and um, not Kim Kardashian, right? There are people, there are many, many people out there, not superstars, most people that no one's ever heard of. Most people listening to this don't know who Mr. Beast is. If you don't know who he is, you gotta go Google him. Mr. Beast is the most famous or most important sort of food content creator on the internet, I'll say content creator. He's the number one uh, content creator on YouTube. He makes a ton of money. So when he opens a burger <laughs> a burger uh, shop in the mall, they get 50,000 people out to the, the, the opening of it. Mr. Beast is a big deal. Most people have never heard of him. My parents have never heard of him. I love that there are non-traditional ways, new ways of making money, of making businesses, of creating our lives. And to the point, I guess to bring this all full circle, the thing that I didn't realize and the thing that maybe most young people don't realize is that there's more than one way to do it. Um, that's true for us in our own personal trajectories. Certainly was true for you, certainly true for me. Um, and I think there's more than one way to do it for how to build a restaurant, how to build a business, how to serve people, um, how to serve people delicious food. We're all here because we want to take care of people. We want to feed people. Um, and I think there's more than one way to do it aside from putting up a brick and mortar, four walls. Um, I've just certainly, the, the more people I talk with and the more places I go, um, I just keep coming across clients who make really cool lives for themselves, doing it non-traditional ways. And um, 
that's one of the exciting parts about what you're doing and how and how they're doing it at Escoffier. It's saying like, hey, there's no there's no right or wrong way to learn this. Let's just learn it. And there's no right or wrong way to build a career or to take these skills and apply them. Maybe that's Krispy Kreme. Maybe that's some fancy bakery. Maybe that's something else uh, entirely. Maybe that's just being a content creator online. But now that you know the tools, you figure out a way to go do it. Um, I, I I love that, and I, I think it's um. I think it's a really cool place to end. What um, what sort of advice can you give to the listeners here? Um, you've got a really cool career, and you've gone through uh, a really interesting trajectory. So you got a, I don't know, you got a, you got a whole bunch of people in the audience listening. What sort of uh, insights, words of advice would you would you leave them with? I would say, if anything, just be true to who you are and what you know, and don't discount whatever experiences you've had that have brought you to the exact point where you are right now. You know, take all of that and implement it into something else. Don't be afraid to try something new, because here's the thing. You have overcome so much in your personal life, professional life, to get to where you are right now that it doesn't matter what might be in front of you because you can do it because of everything you've already done. So don't be afraid of, you know, taking that next sort of step and seeing what might open up for you. That's kind of the most exciting thing about life in general, is that no one person has any one specific path that you must walk, and that is it. No, explore. All of a sudden, who knows what is around the bend? It could be 38 new paths. Walk all of them. Who cares? You know, Don't yep. be afraid to just try something and use what you have because you are successful. That's why you're here. That's why you're where you are. So, like, I love it. I love it. Don't worry about it. You know, Nike, I guess, <laughs> had it right. Just, just do it. Just, just do, do it. it. You, you know, in the end, that's our differentiator, right? Like, there is no, there is no two yous. There's, o- there's only one of you in the world and it's all your shared experiences and insights and perspectives have added up to something really unique and worthwhile um and we're all better off with that being in the world and the more we celebrate that that's what makes us stand out and certainly food is a very uh, saturated market um these days so how do you stand out from everybody else uh, by being the most you you can be um listen i appreciate you taking time to be here uh we ran over i appreciate you uh you sitting patiently and going through this i think this is really worthwhile i'm glad we didn't cut this short um where can people go to connect with you learn more about you and everything that's going on with you well, first and foremost, you can go to um, escoffier.edu to learn more about Escoffier School of Culinary Arts and the most amazing programs that we have. We've been, you know, introducing some new things. We have a plant-based program. We have a holistic program now, which is so, you know, kind of crazy. And how can food actually help to heal us? Um, which is so, so very exciting. If you want to follow me personally, uh, I am Chef Steve Konopelski. On Instagram, my Facebook got hacked, so don't go there anymore. Um, <laughs> you can find me on TikTok as well. And if you want to check out some fun stuff that I did on the YouTube, uh, look up The Sweet Life of Steve, my own uh, little YouTube show. Uh, please like and subscribe. Excellent. And we will include all of those links. uh, So no need to search too deep. They will all be in the show notes. Uh, Listen, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so very much for having me. This has been a blast. And thank you, listeners. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you, guys. So again, I want to thank Stephen for taking time out of his day to sit and chat with me. All the links are in the show notes, as they always are. Big thanks to uh, to all of you for tuning in. Big thanks to the uh, sponsors for making this show possible. Appreciate you guys being here. Remember, two shows every single week. Mondays are interviews. Thursdays are the monologue episodes. Appreciate you being here, and I'll see you next time.